The consolidated PB-2, also known as the P-30, was a two-seat pursuit fighter that entered service with the US Army Air Corps in the mid-1930s. It was notable as being the first aircraft to enter service that included all the design features that would set the standard for fighter aircraft design moving forward. It featured all-metal construction, a cantilever monoplane wing, a retractable undercarriage, an enclosed and heated cockpit, and a turbo-supercharged engine. Some of these features had been introduced on other fighter designs here and there, but this was the first time that everything would be bundled together in the same airframe. Though produced by Consolidated, the origins of the P-30 can be traced back to the Lockheed Aircraft Company and its parent organization, the Detroit Aircraft Company. The Detroit Lockheed XP-900 was a private venture that began back in 1931. The Army had recently purchased a Lockheed Altair as a staff transport, and they had been suitably impressed with its performance, notably its top speed. It encouraged them to seek out designs for a low-wing monoplane fighter with a retractable undercarriage, something that up until this point had only been featured on a few experimental military aircraft, such as the Boeing YB-9. Unfortunately, the Great Depression had resulted in a significantly reduced budget, and they couldn't actually afford to order a prototype for testing. And so, Detroit Lockheed offered to fund the development costs themselves. Designed at Detroit by engineer Robert Woods, a mock-up was presented to the Army in March 1931, and after a favourable review, construction of a prototype began with the designation assigned of XP-900. Of mixed construction, the XP-900 combined a slim metal fuselage and tail with the wooden spar wings of the Lockheed Altair. It had a wingspan of 42 feet 9 inches, a length of 28 feet 9 inches, and a height of 8 feet 6 inches. Loaded, it had a total weight of approximately 4,300 pounds, and it was to be equipped with three machine guns, two forward-firing guns operated by the pilot, 130 caliber 150, and another 30 caliber gun was operated by the rear gunner. Power would come from a 600 horsepower Curtis V1570C Conqueror, and this drove a three blade fixed pitch propeller. The XP900 flew for the first time at the end of the summer, and following a brief evaluation period, it was purchased by the Army in September, being redesignated as the YP24. It was then subjected to further tests to see if it could be a suitable replacement for the two-seat P-16, which was built by Berliner Joyce, and the single-seat P-6E, which was built by Curtis. At the conclusion of these tests, it proved to be faster than both, with a top speed of around 235 miles an hour, and because of this, the Army ordered additional versions as pre-production service test aircraft. Five were ordered as the Y1P24 two-seat fighter, and four were ordered as the Y1A-9, this being envisioned as an attack aircraft that carried additional guns as well as external bombs. However, neither of these would end up being built, as fate intervened. Firstly, the original prototype was lost on October the 19th. Following a successful test flight, test pilot Harrison Crocker was getting prepared to land when the crank handle for the undercarriage snapped off in his hand, which was slightly inconvenient as it meant he couldn't get the wheels down. As a rather valuable test pilot, he was not given permission to attempt a wheels-up landing and instead was ordered to bail out, with the now pilotless prototype crashing into the ground. Then, eight days after the prototype had crashed and burned, the Detroit Lockheed Company followed it, figuratively speaking, by going bankrupt. But this was not the end of Robert Wood's promising aircraft. Not long after his employer's bankruptcy, he was hired by the Consolidated Aircraft Corporation, who took interest in his design. Woods believed it could be further improved, and he was given permission to make various refinements, with Consolidated submitting an updated design to the Army in March of 1932. Changes included the switch to completely all-metal wings, a larger tail, the substitution of metal for fabric covering on the tail control surfaces, and the installation of a turbo supercharger. This aircraft was ordered to be built as the Y1P25, and after a slow construction period of seven months, 
as this was only the company's second experience with all metal wings, and their first experience with using turbo supercharged engines, it was delivered to the army on the 9th of December. In one of its first test flights, it achieved a top speed of 247 miles an hour, despite a weight gain of almost 1,000 pounds, courtesy of the turbo supercharger, and it was then joined by a second prototype that was known as the XA-11. Like the previous Y1A9, this was an attack aircraft variant. The armament was increased to four forward-firing machine guns, 230 caliber 250, and it could carry up to 400 pounds of bombs on external racks. It then seemed that the prototypes of Wood's design appeared to have some sort of curse placed upon them, as both of these prototypes were lost within a fortnight. The Y1P25 was lost after entering an unrecoverable flat spin during stress testing, killing test pilot Captain Hugh Elmendorf, and just over a week later, Lieutenant Irvin Woodring would be killed when the XA-11 broke up without warning during a test flight above Wright Field. Following an evaluation of both losses, the Air Corps concluded that there wasn't a fatal flaw in the design, but rather that the airframes had been pushed beyond their limits. The XA-11, for example, had been pulling tight maneuvers after achieving top speeds that were pushing 280 miles an hour, which for the time was considerably fast. The design in general still showed good promise, and the Army Air Corps ordered four modified production versions of each prototype as the P-30 and the A-11. Modifications included reinforcements to the fuselage and wing routes to prevent further mishaps, uprated engines of 675 horsepower, a revised canopy, and a simpler but sturdier retractable undercarriage. These were delivered towards the end of 1933, and they began service tests in January of 1934. Though they performed well, the two-seat arrangement didn't particularly impress the pilots of the Army Air Corps. Many argued that if you needed a rear gunner in a fighter aircraft, you'd already failed as a pilot, which did make a lot of sense. And there was also the problem that during mock dogfights, it was discovered that most high-G maneuvers often rendered the rear gunner unconscious, which made their position even more irrelevant. Having heard the complaints of their pilot officers, the senior air staff of the Air Corps nodded sagely and said that they would take them on board, and then ordered more aircraft anyway. They placed an order for 50 of the fighter version as the P-30A, though no orders would be forthcoming for the attack version. Before delivery was completed, the type was redesignated as the PB-2A, the PB standing for Pursuit by Place. Now, this was meant to differentiate it from the other fighter aircraft that were entering service at the time, which were all single-seaters, but this caused all kinds of confusion, as the letters PB were usually the abbreviation for patrol bomber used by the Navy. Nevertheless, the title stuck, and deliveries of the PB-2A were completed by July 1936, with the type entering service with the 27th and 94th Pursuit Squadrons. The PB-2A was now a significantly different beast when compared to the original design of the XA-900. It now had a 700 horsepower version of the Curtis Conqueror engine, the V1570-61, which made use of a new and improved General Electric F2H supercharger. This gave it much better performance at high altitude when compared to the previous P30, achieving 275 miles an hour at 25,000 feet, and this led to the installation of a dedicated oxygen and heating system for the cabin. The armament had been scaled back to the original plan of two guns in the nose, with a single in the rear for defence, and the PB-2A now had a wingspan of 43 feet 11 inches, a length of 30 feet, and a height of 8 feet 3 inches. Though it was the highest performing and most modern aircraft in Air Corps service, its service life was relatively brief and relatively uneventful, with most of the aircraft already being phased out of frontline use by the end of 1939. Despite having good high-altitude capabilities, which would have made it an excellent interceptor, the PB-2A was rarely used at said altitudes, as the early heating systems installed in the cabin only really functioned in the optimistic hopes and dreams of the man who designed it. 
Pilots often complained of near freezing temperatures, and the poor rear gunner had it even worse. One PB-2A was modified into a single-seat prototype, which was flown as a potential successor to the single-seat open-cockpit Boeing P-26P shooter, but it was larger and heavier than the other competitors, and, as it was a prototype, it fell victim to the old curse of its predecessors, and was written off in a crash before its evaluations were completed. Though it possessed innovative features, the concept of the twin-seat fighter was already falling out of fashion by the time the PB-2A was entering service, and within a couple of years, it was considered totally unsuitable as a pursuit fighter. After having them for just one year, the 27th and 94th Pursuit Squadrons exchanged their aircraft for single-seat Seversky P-35s and Curtis P-36s, with the PB-2As going to the 33rd, 35th, and 36th Squadrons of the 8th Pursuit Group in Virginia. But their time there was almost equally as brief. After 18 months, they also began to re-equip with the P-36, and by the end of 1939, most of the PB-2As had been transferred to training schools. A few lingered on into the war years, but by the middle of 1942, the few remaining aircraft were merely static training frames for ground schools and mechanics, and all of these were then scrapped by the end of 1943. If you want to learn more about the PB-2 and the other aircraft related to it, I recommend the following books, and I've put links to each in the video description below. In no particular order, we've got Lockheed Aircraft Since 1913 by René Francillon, General Dynamics Aircraft and Their Predecessors by John Wegg, American Attack Aircraft Since 1926 by E.R. Johnson, U.S. Fighters of the Army Air Force 1925 to the 1980s by Lloyd Jones, and United States Military Aircraft Since 1909 by Swanborough and Bowers. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the channel supporters over on Patreon. It's quite interesting how we see two-seat fighters fall in and out of favour multiple times over the decades, and perhaps that's a special topic worth discussing in the future. We'll see. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, uh, now, some people have been asking for some more in-depth book recommendations, and that is something that I'm definitely planning to do, but the library isn't quite complete yet, so that's probably going to be something that gets done in the new year, but I promise book reviews will be forthcoming eventually. But, as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.